Well, good morning to you, Alberta. It's Ryan Jesperson and Danielle Smith coming to you together. Simulcast from the beautiful 770 CHQR studio along 17th Avenue in Calgary, the morning after Alberta votes. Well, that pretty well summed it up, didn't it? I guess we can move on to other topics today. Everything's covered. Yeah, there we Everything's go. figured out. The Alberta Liberals will live on. Albertans spoke loud and clear, a conservative majority. Rachel Notley's staying on, and we'll see what the Alberta party does. But I suspect there's more to say than just that, and we'll spend the next few hours at least sifting through what we saw last night. No more hypotheticals, Danielle. Mm-hmm. We now know what it looks like moving forward. That was uh, quite a room last night, wasn't it? It was It was sort of funny when you're in those rooms because it sort of starts to build slowly, and you can imagine if the poll results were not coming in the way that they had hoped that they would, you wouldn't have ended up with as many people there at 11.30. It was packed by, by uh, the time he, he delivered his speech. It was amazing. Yeah, it sure was, and it was great to be down there. Before we go any further, Let's give a huge shout out to the uh, incredibly talented teams with Chorus Radio and Global News. Uh, It was uh, an unbelievable experience to be part of that production and and thousands of hours of work went into it behind the scenes leading up uh, to providing Alberta's best election coverage. Uh, It it was remarkable to see the reports uh, quite literally from across the province, but in particular, some of those writings, and we'll focus on them today, the writings people were paying close attention to. Wanted to see how Derek Fildebrand would fare against Leela here. Wanted to see if Greg Clark could keep his seat or if Doug Schweitzer might take that one. Wanted to see how the NDP would do in Calgary and the Conservatives in Edmonton. What would Red Deer do? What would Lethbridge do? How about Lesser Slave Lake? We'll get into all of these storylines. Yeah, we sure will. It's uh, fascinating to me that we're in a position now where we have a more experienced opposition when it comes to cabinet level experience than we do on the conservative bench. Now, I'm sure that the UC, UCP will be will be able to bring in some of the people who had that memory of how to do things from the old times, and Jason will obviously be able to bring in people from uh, from the federal level. But what were we counting up? 11 cabinet ministers plus, plus. Rachel Notley. So uh, that gives you basically half of their caucus uh, let's, you know, She's probably it, wishing she had appointed more cabinet ministers before she ended up going into the, the writ period because that, that had an impact. If you had the name recognition, the profile, had maybe a few successes under your belt, it looks like it allowed you to, to squeak in, even in Calgary, um, when it, when things were... And it's it's I did do a bit of a breakdown as well to see how things were going in Calgary because you get the overall number, and all throughout the course of the campaign, we kept getting those, those poll results that suggested things were narrowing. So I wondered, was it really that close? And it's a mirror image in Edmonton versus Calgary. You're going to have to explain this to me. So in Calgary, it was uh, somewhere, uh, it was 53% for the, uh, the the UCP. And in the, uh, for the NDP, it was 34%. Edmonton total flip, uh, 52% for the NDP and 35% for the, for the UCP. So uh, it seems to me there's a, there's a different culture in the two cities, maybe a different set of priorities in the two cities. That's a, that's a pretty wide margin. Well, and then look at this. I mean, within uh, two, three percentage points of what you're talking about, if you take Alberta as a whole, uh, the UCP with 55, just over 55% of the popular vote, uh, represented by about 920,000. Now, keep in mind, one thing that we should point out is that today, uh, starting today, about 230,000 vote anywhere ballots will be counted. So the numbers that we'll be bringing you right now do not include uh, 230,000 votes still to be counted. But yep. provincially speaking, province-wide, the United Conservatives taking about 55, 55.2% of the popular vote. The NDP with 322 percent of the popular vote and then the Alberta party in third with a, just over nine percent total. I admit I don't I didn't see any numbers on what the total voter turnout ended up being because they were saying that um, <laughs> when you looked at the number of people who came to the advanced polls that was half the number that turned turned out in total last time. I think Dwayne Bratt was predicting that we'd still end up with just fewer people showing up on election day and we'd be around 60 percent but I got to look around for that number to see if we know for sure. I think I'm trying to do quick 7, math. There was 2.7 <laughs> million eligible so uh, um, okay, uh, Brian's got his calculator out. It well, looks like right now it's about it's about uh, off the top of my head approximately 1.65 million. Wow, so. uh, which would be up from about well, I think 1.48 ish. Yeah. Uh, and I'm doing this off the top of my so head, but approximately. Engagement. I would say that that um, advanced balloting approach was successful. I think the more people make it as convenient as possible, if we could just use the Scantron machines next time, I'll be very happy so that we can get more immediate results. But I think if we could use that approach, it obviously is a lot more convenient for people and people came out as a result. But it'll be interesting today. I don't know if you had a few that you were going to keep an eye on as they do the recount, because it looks like um, the three NDP seats are pretty solid in 
Calgary, um, Buffalo, that's Joe Sisi, uh, McCall, that's uh, or Fence Beer, also a cabinet minister, former cabinet minister, and Mountain View, K- Kathleen Ganley. But Calgary Curry and Calgary Varsity are within that band that could potentially flip if the um, advance ballot went the, went the other way. So th- there's probably some peop- some candidates who are, are waiting to, to, for, to, to have the celebration until they know for sure after the count today. I don't know if there are any others that popped up that could potentially go the other way. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I would certain uh, if I would characterize Banff as... I mean, it is relatively speaking, it's relatively close. It's with about 700 votes, and it's, mm. it looks like it's going to flip back to the United Conservatives uh, from Cameron West. Had, of course, the NDP incumbent there. But again, we'll wait and see. 700 would be a pretty significant uh, hurdle to overcome, but it's not impossible. It would, it would depend how many were counted there. I remember what Bra- Dwayne Brett last night, he was saying pretty well anything within that 500 vote band is something that could potentially flip, especially if you think that those who came out earlier may have been younger, wanting the convenience polling out, voting at their polling station at their university or college and so it, that that may tend to trend more towards the NDP vote so that's part of the reason it, it could uh, potentially The other flip. one that you and I were keeping an eye on and that we continue to this morning is Lethbridge West uh, which is where of course the incumbent environment minister Shannon Phillips uh, running against formidable competition at least one that's given her a run for her money she's leading by about 300 votes right now but there are 1700 mm-hmm. vote anywhere ballots still to be counted in Lethbridge Bridge West. I corresponded with her briefly last night. She said that they're confident. She said they feel good about it, but there's no way of knowing what the what the advanced ballots will look like, it's what a, those vote anywhere ballots will look it's like. It's a lot closer than I would have expected. I'm sort of torn. I don't I don't quite know whether or not the strategy of ha- of having the early vote to get the kids who are voting on campuses is going to work for her or against her in that riding because Lethbridge um, has both the college and the university. I don't know if they're both in her riding or if one goes in one and one goes in the other, but you would think that by voting on campus at one of those anywhere polls, it's the kids who don't live in Lethbridge who are going to have their vote assigned somewhere else. So that might not help her. And so it could be that uh, she might be, uh, she, she might, she might still be in tough on that riding when we do the, the, the recount today. I felt like one of my safest predictions was that Red Deer was going to collectively swing back blue. And boy, did it ever last night. You'll remember that the two seats in Red Deer were won by NDP MLAs in, in 2015. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and last night, respectively, in those two ridings, Red Deer North and South, about 4,600 votes for the for the NDP uh, in Red Deer North, about 5,900 in Red Deer South. And, and those, I mean, matched by 12,000 and 13,000, respectively, for the Conservatives. So Red Deer spoke loud and clear, as did Rimby Rock and Mountain House which was, I don't think, any doubt there. But Joe uh, Anglin was running there, wasn't just he? Just west of that. Was, that was just that, that. To me, is one of the weirdest candidate affiliations. No, it's the weirdest. Uh, I, unless there's one that's... So I imagine mean, uh, Stephen Mandel and Joe Anglin being in the same caucus. Well, I mean, you, 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 you have, have a, a more clear understanding of what Joe Anglin's... We're not going to sit here and take pod shots at Joe Anglin, but the fact of the matter is he's, is he's either been represented on the ballot or has been tied or affiliated to five different political parties in the province of Alberta. And I just thought that... I mean, I, I know that the Alberta party were taking some unconventional steps and measures to get on people's radar. They had some pretty interesting... I mean, the, the former mayor of Edmonton comes down here to Calgary and, and tells Calgarians that there's going to be mandatory water fluoridation, which I just thought was an awesome troll job. Uh, Steve Mandel also stepping out and saying, if you want to go to public schools under an Alberta party government, you've got to be vaccinated. I liked that move. It got people's attention, got him talking. The the, the first ever autonomous v- only vehicle lane on the QE2, the first ever. Idea. Can, it's kind of a idea. neat idea because listen, I mean, sometimes these big, huge ideas need to be put in play by somebody who's 10, 15, 20 years ahead of their time. That's fine. My my point is, these, this was example after example after example of, of, of policy platforms or steps the Alberta Party thought they could take to get people's attention. And I, and I put the Joe Anglin uh, candidacy in that conversation, but to me, that was just a weird one. Generally speaking, in the, in the grand scheme of things, the big perspective, irrelevant doesn't matter. Uh, they probably just wanted to run somebody in there with name recognition against yeah. a, a strong incumbent there. But, that, but, but anyone who had a... St- I mean, there are a few with strong name recognition. I know that Rick Strangman, as another independent, tried to win in his riding win after he lost the nomination to Nate Horner, did not succeed. Ian Donovan came back again as an independent down south trying to win that seat back. But the mood of the public, I think was one of, you've got to make a choice. If you're if you're going to vote for a progressive vision, you vote for Rachel Notley and the NDP. If you're going to vote for a conservative vision, you vote for Jason Kenney and the UCP. The, uh, the, the Alberta party turned out to be the spoiler. When you look at where the NDP vote was in the last election, at around 40%, 
Uh, they're down to 33 percent, 33, 34. And that's almost the margin that the Alberta party ended up stealing away from them. So it does look to me, um, if you do the math, that the the sum was equal to the the two parts. You add together the Wild Rose and the, and the PC vote from the last election, and it looks like that's what Jason got. Astonishingly, I would have thought there would have been a lot more bleed out from uh, from some of the progressives, but it doesn't look like that happened. There were a ton of writings we're keeping an eye on. The good thing is, Danielle, the good news is that we have three hours to sift through it. Yes. I want to talk to you about, I had an opportunity to talk to Leela here in person last night, obviously beaming. It was a, uh, a hard-fought campaign for her. Uh, Derek Fildebrandt, uh, you know, with respect, was just a blip on the radar last night. Like, yeah, like, did he, he didn't even, because uh, there were some polls that suggested he was in second place, but not when it came time uh, to count the ballots. No, I mean, I'm, it's it was, uh, it was, uh, it was probably a, a bit of a, a perspective check, a bit of a reality check for him, which would, which would probably be a difficult one to swallow. And, and we can revisit that one and, and what that says maybe about the future of the Freedom Conservative Party, maybe what it even says about uh, fledgling federal parties like the the People's Party of Canada, led by Maxime Bernier. I know that, that Derek at least publicly feels a kinship with Maxime Bernier. Wouldn't be surprised to maybe see him seek a federal seat in that riding. Although, I mean, how do you not get chased away with what the electorate told you last night? Another riding I was curious to see was a a reputable MLA, uh, relatively speaking, I think even across the uh, across the aisle, a respected MLA out of Calgary Southeast, Rick Fraser, who was uh, elected, of course, as as a PC, and then and then uh, declined to join the United Conservatives, instead crossing the floor to the Alberta Party. Uh, I wondered how he might do, and, and I'm curious for your take on. I mean, typically we've seen and. Obviously, you know uh, that some floor crossers, it's, it can be difficult to seek re-election. But I did not think that Rick Fraser would get beaten as soundly as he did in Calgary Southeast. Matt Jones uh, will be taking that riding for the United Conservatives. And But here's the thing. Not only did, did Rick Fraser uh, have, have a tough go against the United Conservatives, he was also beaten in total votes. So Matt Jones takes about 9,800 votes in that riding to Rick Fraser's 3,100 but Heather Eddy, the NDP candidate, took 3,300. Yeah, and that just goes to show you that uh, people understood. It's, it's, I didn't see as strong a campaign this time to consolidate the vote around a single choice as I have in previous election campaigns. But people are conditioned to that kind of strategic voting, and that must have been what happened there. What I found interesting is that uh, I'll have to take a closer look at it, but there will be a couple of ridings that the NDP lost because the Alberta party was the spoiler. And so <laughs> that, that will again cause people to pause in the next go round about whether or not having a third party option is something that they want to see on the ballot. Hey, we should probably take a pause and, uh, and come back in a minute. Let's do it. It's Ryan Jespers and Danielle Smith on Chorus Radio Province Wide. All right, it's Danielle Smith here with Ryan Jesperson. We are Chorus Province-wide, just doing some election debriefing. Uh, I should tell you what's coming up. We've got David Aiken, Chief Political Correspondent for Global News, coming up right after the news, followed by Dr. Bob Murray, who's a political scientist and managing director of Denton's Canada Government Group. Just give his, us his take, because in some ways this almost felt like a federal election with all the federal messaging around that, and I'm sure that'll be another angle that we talk about. And then is so, uh, I th- we're going to have lots of time for calls. We still have a few candidates that we're lining up, but... Uh, if your dial finger is itchy, just save it for half an hour. 403-974-8255 is the number to text. You can also call 1-800-563-7770. And you can also, our Ched friends can also still continue to text at 630-630. Are you getting any comments in? Yeah, well, I'm just taking a look at uh, a message here from Chris. He says, I'm in Calgary Southeast. Rick Fraser is writing. Chris, thanks for tuning in. He says it, it, it almost seemed like Rick Fraser was resigned to defeat. Uh, he says, I, Matt, uh, the winning UCP candidate, was incessantly door knocking, getting known all of his hard work paid off. It, it, this is an interesting one. I was keeping an eye on, you know, for example, uh, Evans and Rutherford, uh, you know, uh, Catherine O'Neill is is a candidate that was running for the Alberta Party, former president of the PC Party, and I know that she was out there. I only know because I see her Instagram, her Twitter. She was knocking on doors, thousands of doors. Uh, you know, saw some Alberta Party candidates. Uh, Mo Rahal is another one that was knocking on, he told me he knocked on 10,000 doors. And, and and you have to think, I mean, this morning, I, I feel like there's a not a mixed message, but a twofold message. There's There's got to be huge uh, disappointment being felt by by candidates that were not successful but at the same time you want to say with with all sincerity I'm, I'm, I'm taking my glasses off Danielle and looking up into the cameras so people can see us eye to eye that are watching us streaming on Facebook live right now a huge amount of respect for candidates from all the parties that put in the volunteers and the donors and the people
people that you know more uh, behind the scenes of what goes into this, but yep. thousands of hours go into trying to get elected with no guarantees it's going to happen. It's so true. It's funny, too, because the number of people who got in touch with me saying, I've emailed my candidate and they never got back to me, so I'm not voting for them, or the only candidate I met was so-and-so, and that's the reason I'm voting for them. That is why it is so important to have personal contact with candidates yeah. and the candidates to do that extra hard work. And Jason Kenney comes from a machine, a federal machine that knows the importance of door knocking. Wouldn't surprise me a bit if they had mandatory hours that they had to spend at the doors and do a regular check-in just to sh- make sure that they were out there because uh, that's the only way that you win. You have, yeah. to, you have to meet people. we got to take a pause. When we get back, we'll continue our conversation, but we'll be joined by David Aiken, Chief Political Correspondent for Global News. I'm here with J- Ryan Jesperson. I'm Danielle Smith, and we'll be right back on Chorus Radio. Well, good morning to you. It's 9.32. It's Ryan Jesperson with Danielle Smith, Chorus Radio. I was, you know, I, I stopped myself there for a second, Danielle. I, I just about said coast to coast to coast. <laughs> but in a sense, don't you get the, don't you get the, the idea that maybe for some folks that would be the reality if they got to, if they got to call the shots, that if we're talking province wide, it would be coast to coast to coast. It would be boundary to boundary to boundary. Wouldn't that be fun? Jason Kenney led off with that idea. I mean, I'm not talking about specific it's separation funny, I, last I night. I always talk about, whenever I heard coast to coast to coast, I always think of Justin Trudeau. I don't normally associate that, right? that with Jason Kenney. Yeah, he says it all the time. No, I mean, I'm, I associate it with radio broadcasters, but my only point so is boundary to, boundary to boundary to boundary to boundary. To boundary. Uh, uh, but Top he did. But, I mean, li- literally almost out of the gates. And, and we'll be bringing you as, as part of our comprehensive post-election analysis this morning, uh, portions of Jason Kenney's victory speech, Rachel Notley's concession speech, and what some of the other party leaders had to say as well. But he, he, he came out of the gates after stepping out of that blue pickup truck and up to the podium last night, it, almost right away, talking about getting a fair deal, talking about Alberta's contribution to Confederation, talking about, you know, I mean, he, the, he set the tone right out of the gates. That wasn't something that he saved for paragraph number 19. No, but it was a more positive message than I think some heard in the clips throughout the course of the campaign. I think in the course of the campaign, he was a lot tougher and sounded more uncompromising. Last night, I think he sounded very statesmanlike, but I think that you know with him that it's a one-two. It's my first step is going to be to stretch out my hand to see if we can work together. The next step is if that doesn't work, then we've got some other levers. And so we know what those levers are. We already have a plan for an equalization referendum. This, this will be interesting to see how that plays out. Because he acknowledged last night that Francois Legault, the Quebec premier, campaigned on wanting to wean his province off equalization. And so wouldn't it be something if you got some kind of detente between Alberta and, and Quebec and jointly, they were able to go into whichever negotiations with the federal government saying, hey, you know what, we've agreed that we've got to change this. It might negate the need for an equalization referendum. So that would be, uh, but if it doesn't happen, then he's got that as a hammer. And then he's also got the turn off the taps hammer as well. Yeah, which I think is probably more significant, more realistic, more formidable. Let's ask our first guest, our lead off guest this morning, the chief political correspondent for Global News who did, uh, and I'm not just saying this because you're on the line with us, David Aiken, uh, but a phenomenal job last night employing some pretty impressive technology as, as well. You'd have people believing that you've been covering Alberta politics specifically for 25 years. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. And might I say, you looked fabulous on TV. Danielle, you look terrific always. I wasn't I wearing... I really outdid himself. I know, I wasn't wearing a bow tie. That bow tie was pretty awesome. No, that bow tie and the little puff, it was great. Well, you know, my first big exposure to the great thing that is Alberta electoral politics, the first time I was on a campaign trail, was Danielle's, uh, you know, famous run back there in uh, 2012. And, uh, and Alberta politics are fascinating. We saw it again last night. More history really being made. I mean, I don't know if you guys can get your head around this, but you changed the government after just four years. Oh, my God. That doesn't normally uh, happen. You know, I wanted to ask you, David, about what you thought the message was to the rest of Canada, because I think now that, because uh, that's where your focus normally is. Oh, yes. And there were so many messages that were that were geared towards our friends in other provinces. What did What stuck out for you? Uh, The message to Quebec uh, that you just touched on a minute ago and that little section where Kenny spoke French and you guys were in the room. I detected people, you know, Kenny said, guys, guys, I'm going to speak French. Just just let me speak French here. I don't think there was much doing, but um, but sending that message to Premier Legault, I covered the last meeting of the premiers. uh, And of course, Premier Notley was at that one. But, you know, one of the things Legault was saying 
it was much the same message that Kenny had about, will you please let us develop our resources? And in Quebec, the energy resource there is hydroelectricity. They're looking for the feds to say, can we, you know, get projects to get more hydroelectric grids to the rest of Canada? Okay, let's take Francois Legault up on that. And Kenny's message presumably is, and in the meantime, so long as you're still using oil and gas, let's make sure we've got the infrastructure to uh, export Alberta's and Saskatchewan's energy. Well, so that sounds that sounds a, like um, it could be an uh, amazing project if you could have a single right of way and you've got transmission lines oh. coming across the country interconnecting our hydroelectric resources at the same time as you've got a, 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 a bitumen or a, a crude or a natural gas pipeline buried underneath. I think I think we got a real a real chance of, of being able to have a nation building project going here. Got to have some federal leadership, obviously, and so. You know, I'm, I'm, I haven't made the calls back to Ottawa to see what the, uh, the brain trust around uh, the Trudeau government thinks about Kenny. I have some idea because, um, I don't know if I mentioned this last night, but Brian, I may have mentioned on your show a couple of days ago, you know, the Labour Minister, Patty Hyde, was describing what Jason Kenney is all about as, quote, the politics of cruelty. Now, if you've got Trudeau cabinet ministers doing that, that's really not showing a whole lot of goodwill. And yesterday, you know, in the speech last night, Kenny was very specific, and I think it was good of him to say, let's dial down the rhetoric, everybody. You know, let's stop this. You know, the, the social media stuff is one thing, but real people, real voters, want governments to get along, want governments to get stuff done. But you can't do that if you've got, you know, cab senior cabinet ministers in Ottawa saying, oh, look at that. They've elected someone who engages in the politics of cruelty in uh, in Edmonton. I just think that that's just not productive. Well, and, and I think it's safe to suggest that probably the Trudeau Liberals are, are, are on the campaign uh, trail right now as they have been, uh, albeit walking on their heels, it seems, uh, already taking steps they can to reverse his personal popularity dive, David, as well as is sort of a trend we're seeing with regards to party support. The question is this that I have for you, though. I mean, I, I talked to, I was speaking at a Alberta, Alberta Urban Municipalities Association a political panel a while ago, and, and uh, the, the mayor of Innisfail stood up and he said, you know, a lot of our residents on their own dime spent about $10,000 to drive their big rigs all the way to Parliament Hill to send a message. And his question was, why didn't we get a more significant reception? Why didn't we get the media coverage or the respect we were looking for? And one of the responses we heard from the panel, which was kind of interesting, is that people in Ontario and Quebec really aren't paying as much attention to Alberta as Alberta would like to think they are. Do you think Jason Kenney's message, even spoken in French last night, resonated in Quebec? Well, I mean, we'll have to see. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure about that protest. I was on Parliament Hill covering it that day. And, yeah, I can tell you that I think pretty sure we led, didn't lead with it. It was in our national newscast. But don't forget, unfortunately, that protest also got associated with a whole bunch of the yellow vesters it's totally derailed are, yeah and so you know i'm just putting that out there but back to the bigger issue is the rest of the country paying attention to alberta I, I think so i'm convinced of it and that's why you know this idea that trudeau is now campaigning or will campaign against kenny there's a lot of people in ontario who are very sympathetic to you know what jason kenny and even Rachel Notley were talking about the frustration that Alberta, wherever it turns, it's landlocked, its resources are landlocked. I think a lot of people in Ontario get that. There's a lot of small C conservative voters in Ontario who will be very sympathetic to uh, Jason Kenney's message. And so if you're the prime minister and you think it's a good idea now to take on Brian Pallister in Manitoba and Scott Moe in Saskatchewan and Jason Kenney and Ontario's Doug Ford. Speaking of which, let me ask you guys, I thought I heard, but there was a big whoop when Kenny gave a shout out to Ford. Did I get that right last night? Oh yeah, they, well, and, a, and an even bigger whoop when they shouted out to Scott Moe, because half of the room was probably yeah. from Saskatchewan originally. But I figured that, Can, can yeah. you talk more about that? Because I think this is just it. It's not now just Kenny versus Trudeau. It's Kenny, no. Moe, Pallister, Ford, uh, Higgs. And Wayne Higgs. Out, yes, yeah. and even he mentioned McLeod up in Northwest Territories as well. And if we can get Legault on side, that changes the dynamic. I don't know if I've seen this before, that many aligned conservative premiers up against a liberal prime minister. Minister. What, what does that hold for the for the federal election? Well, I'm pretty sure, and I, we heard this from Kenny on the stump, not last night, is that those those uh, that block of conservative premiers are going to do everything they can in their power to make sure Trudeau does not get reelected this fall. That is certainly from a political standpoint, that's one thing. So we've just seen some pretty effective political machines uh, in Ontario and in uh, in Alberta flex their muscle, and I assume those machines will be made available to. Andrew Shear and his team. 
Uh, so that's sort of one thing which I find interesting. Um, but again, if you're Trudeau, maybe there's something you want to you, you want to take the temperature down. I think Trudeau's going to look at the campaign Notley ran. This a lot of my federal conservative friends are taking a lot of note of this. You know, Notley ran a campaign where the strategy was we've got to demonize Kenny. We've got to demonize the UCP. And the UCP gave them lots of ammunition with a lot of these candidates that should have been more properly vetted that had dumb stuff on their Facebook posts. But nonetheless, that attack campaign, the negative campaign that Notley ran, my conservative friends are going, look, did it get them anything? Not a damn thing. Uh, and so now, as we see Justin Trudeau out there, pretty much calling Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives racist and why do white supremacists find their home in the, in the federal Conservative Party and so on and so on, I think there's going to be a lot of voters that are going to be put off by that. A lot of the, the voters that could be persuaded, the persuadable voters, will not like that sort of thing. Yeah, and David, you could very well be right, although you don't know if that if that messaging maybe plays better in Ontario, plays better in British Columbia, plays better in Quebec, who knows? We, we've got time for one more with you quickly. We're going to talk to Dr. Bob Murray in just a second. David, what do you make of the assertion? I've heard it a few times that, that if, if, if Premier-designate Kenny, uh, you know, really it gets to a point where he doesn't seem that he can work amicably or productively with British Columbia and or Quebec that it could actually serve Justin Trudeau well if it turns out to be sort of an acrimonious relationship it could benefit the federal liberals what do you make of that again I, I, I'm not so sure about that I mean I know they will want to contrast it really depends I think on how Kenny conducts himself if he if Kenny seems reasonable over the next fir firm on his points that he wants to make but seems reasonable then uh, you know I, I don't think the, the foil will be there I'll tell you, I think it would be a mistake, and we're going to find out how much political rhetoric there is versus reality. If you want a pipeline or you want the Trans Mountain expanded, there's a lot of goodwill in British Columbia. Public opinion polls show most British Columbians are, in, are on side with that. And if you start making gas more expensive for British Columbians with some sort of turn off the tap strategy, you're going to spoil that goodwill. You know how much gas is today in Surrey, BC? Buck it's a buck seven. Holy! Buck 70. Oh a buck 70 goodness. a liter. Like, you want to make more pain there? Don't do that, I think, Premier of Designate Kenny. Find friends in British Columbia. You've got a lot there. And similarly, there are friends in the rest of the country. As Doug Ford was tweeting away last night, you know, join us in trying to get your stuff done. So, um, you know, I think the Prime Minister has to be aware of that, that the mood of the country has shifted from 2015. And the electorate, the choice is really, you know, uh, climate change and all that activist stuff or affordability. And we've now seen several conservatives parties provincially hammer home on the affordability side and find great success with the electorate. So I think Trudeau, it'd be wise for him maybe to recalibrate. Mm, great analysis. Thanks, David. David, it was a real uh, pleasure to work with you. Again, excellent job. Thanks for joining us uh, and, and just killing it on the broadcast last night. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you again soon. Talk soon. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, David Aiken, Chief Political Correspondent for Global News. I like this from JP on the text line. He says, just like James Carville was saying in 1992, it's on behalf of Bill stupid. Clinton, it's the economy stupid. JP says the social justice stuff not diminished but sometimes it can't be the, the most prominent topic when people aren't at work. Yeah, and when he says, I thought David Aiken uh, d described it well, that it's about affordability. That's what people are talking about. Uh, just uh, folks in Alberta who have been out of work or are underemployed for the last two years, and yet everything has gone up. That's what they're reacting to, and I guess it's playing out in the rest of the country as well. We'll get to Dr. Bob Murray right after these. All right. Welcome back. I'm Danielle Smith here with Ryan Jesperson. Got a question in from one of our audience. Can you guys comment on Mark Smith's victory? We will do that, but not just yet. So stay tuned for that. We've got a couple more things coming up. In fact, we're going to turn our attention to British Columbia at 10 o'clock. One of my favorite guys to interview, Von Palmer. Vancouver Sun's Provincial Affairs political columnist joins us at 10. So we will talk all things BC coming up at 10 o'clock today. But first, let's get to uh, Dr. Bob Murray. He's political scientist and managing director of Denton's Canada Government Group. He joins us now. Dr. Murray, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So uh, we've, we've talked a, a bit about the, the federal scene, and I know he, uh, that Jason Kenney had a very strong message, not just for our friends in the rest of the country, but also internationally. Are, uh, how, how do you think that was received? Is anyone paying attention to Alberta uh, Alberta's election on the international scene? 
Absolutely. I think this is a really important election for Alberta's business scene, especially especially for any company thinking of investing in Alberta. We've talked a lot about the Alberta economy, but a lot of those messages that we've been hearing are fundamentally questions about Alberta's competitiveness on the global stage. And if we're looking to attract more foreign direct investment to Alberta, more trade opportunities to Alberta, we need an economy that is built on the foundation of being globally competitive. Right now, I think we're well behind that standard. And so knowing what Mr. Kenny's vision is going to be, I think, uh, and what we've heard throughout the campaign, seen in this platform, a lot of those steps are designed specifically to increase our global competitiveness. So I do think that the world is going to be watching. And I think if those changes are enacted and we can get a more competitive, ready economy for Alberta, I think the world will want to come to Alberta. It's the land of opportunity. I think it's a right market to invest in. But we need to make sure that we're doing our part at the provincial level as well as at the local level uh, and the federal level to ensure that we're uh, incentivizing that investment. Uh, Bob, take us into what it is in particular, though, that catches your attention about the the conservative platform, these uh, proposals to draw investment back to restore investor confidence. Uh, The NDP took the corporate tax rate from 10 to 12 percent. Jason Kenney's promised to take it from 12 to 8 over the course of four years. But it it can't be that simple, is it? Removing the cap on on oil sands emissions, 100 megatons. Is is this what we're talking about? I mean, are, are there are there relatively speaking smaller steps that can be taken that can have huge impacts on investment? Absolutely there are. I mean, first of all, having a competitive tax framework in general is incredibly important for competitiveness. So that business tax component is certainly part of it. But I think one of the other elements of the UCP platform that we thought was very important when it comes to global competitiveness is working with municipalities to make sure that we're cutting red tape at all levels to try to incentivize the opportunity for things like development permits, to work with municipalities for site selection, etc. So expediting those processes, uh, making, making sure that we have investment attraction tools. I think there's a, a misnomer that it's simply about uh, incentives in money, whereas you can actually have targeted incentive packages, and we see this all over the world. We see the U.S. using these on a regular basis, uh, and that's one of the reasons that we have trouble in Canada in general trying to attract investment, because we still have a long way to go in having properly modeled investment attraction tools, uh, a coherent regulatory environment. So the summer of, of repeal and making sure that we're reducing our red tape in Alberta is going to be incredibly attractive in terms of increasing our global competitive Uh, Things like economy enabling infrastructure, so not just about throwing money at infrastructure and the projects that people want unnecessarily, it's prioritizing infrastructure projects that are going to be specifically designed to helping Alberta's economy grow and become more globally attractive, and also a skilled workforce. I think there are a number of components of the UCP platform that are designed specifically, you know, whether it's you know, the K-12 to or even post-secondary education, making sure that we have economy-ready students coming out, reflecting the needs of the global economy and our local economy, as well as making sure that the workforce that we have in Alberta that we're attracting to Alberta is designed to build on the strengths that we have and to the strengths that we want. It's almost like the corporate income tax cut is the least important part of the platform based on what I've heard you just say. Oh, I, I think it's a major component for any of those ba- major businesses that want to set up shop, but it's a package deal. It's not just going to be one or the other. I think it, we have to look at this from a holistic perspective. And if you read the UCP platform and the, the we heard what Mr. Kenny said throughout the campaign, I think what we read into that is this is very much a holistic 30,000 foot view of increasing Alberta's global competitiveness. I wanted to ask the off, off Ryan's question to you about the 100 megaton cap because Andrew Leach came out in the final days of the campaign saying, look, this is a package deal as well. If we want to get Trans Mountain built, if we want to get that approval, we have to commit to this 100 megaton cap. If Jason Kenney repeals that, as it sounds like he wants to do, along with repealing the carbon tax and, and taking another look at, at phasing out coal over the, uh, the expedited time frame, then the deal's off on the pipeline. Do, can you tell us how you interpret that? Because that's, I think, one of the, the fears of, about the more aggressive strategy is it might backfire. Well, it, certainly the, the X factor here is, and I know heard David Aiken speak about this before the break, is going to be the relationship between Mr. Kenny and Mr. Trudeau, and whether or not the carbon tax and the megaton uh, cap, et cetera, is going to be the one and only way that we're going to be able to move this forward. So if Mr. Kenny is going to back away from some of those promises on that cap side of things, what is he going to be able to do to still incentivize the building of the pipeline? Uh, and I think this goes back to what David had said, and we talked about this a little bit last night, is what is the difference between what 
was political theater during the campaign versus how to govern pragmatically to actually achieve a major project that is not only in Alberta's interest, but in the national interest in a year where we know the complications with B.C. and a year where we have a federal election. So I don't think it's only going to be linked to that one issue, but that one issue is not going to go away. So we know that the UCP is going to have to have some kind of answer ready to be able to move that forward uh, and still give some kind of political cover to the federal government if they want to move it forward. Dr. Bob Murray, our guest, Managing Director of Denton's Canada Government Group. Uh, Doc, I mean, this development, provincially speaking, cannot be ignored uh, from Alberta East all the way through essentially the Maritimes. You've got conservative premiers and you've got in provincial elections, Canadians uh, planting their flags. This I mean, it has to become more and more and more and more of a concern to Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. Take us into your thoughts on what this means between now and October 21st. Well, I, I'm not sure how many more concerns Mr. Trudeau can have right now uh, leading into the fall. When you, when you look at the, the provincial agendas that are being set, as well as uh, things happening in his own backyard and within his own party, uh, I think when you take a look at the state of the Confederation right now, uh, part of why I think provinces have turned to these alternatives is, yes, of course, there's provincial variables involved, but I think a lot of this is also a rebuke of what we've seen coming from the federal government in some cases. And so that attitude that we've seen Mr. Trudeau governing from, which is, you may not agree with me, but I'm going to move forward with this anyway, because trust me, ladies and gentlemen, this is in the national interest, and I'll tell you that, is obviously not being well received. And I think we've seen fundamental shifts in our political culture, and I've heard both of you talk about this on your respective shows over the last numbers of months, and that we've seen this political shift happening, and not only in Canada, but also in Western democracies around the world, that our traditional left-right spectrums are being affected in the way that we perceive politics, the, way, the role of populism in terms of whose voices are feeling that they're not being heard and how they're going about getting those voices heard and the things that they're willing to support in order to do that. All of this leads into a really interesting election this fall of how is Mr. Trudeau, first of all, going to overcome the challenges he's dealing with right now, as well as being able to harness the message that he wants from the people that he needs to support him and come out and mobilize behind a message going into the fall. But more importantly, I think as well, is what is Mr. Scheer learning from all of this? I think the worst thing for the federal conservatives to believe is that this is solely about a conservative movement or solely a a conservative issue and it's far more about people's voices needing to be heard on certain issues and feeling like for the last number of years maybe they haven't been. I think we we, we saw this a lot in the provincial campaign here in Alberta that I think a a lot of Albertans felt that they were being preached to by the NDP that if you were looking to vote for somebody else there was something wrong with you Uh. by virtue of some of the stances on some of these issues and people clearly spoke last night and in the advanced polling that they resent being told those things. Uh, and certainly make, will make for a very interesting federal election. Thank you so much for your insights today. Appreciate it. Thank you. That was, Thanks, Dr. Bob. That was Dr. Bob Murray, political scientist, managing director of Denton's Canada Government Group. Stay with us.